when I teach, I say this all the time, there's no such thing as a bad art, only bad artists. Hey, Sifu, welcome to Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. Oh, great to be here. It's great nice to, to hear from you, Jeremy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, always good to talk to you. You know, you're an example of someone who I don't usually talk to people for as long or as much as I've talked to you before they end up on the show. It's just, this is just how it happened. And, and, you know, it's not a, it's not a good, it's not a bad, it's just, it is. And I'm glad we're, I mean, on, on, on my end, you know, this feels overdue. So I'm, I'm thankful you're willing to come on. Yeah. Yo, thank you. I, you know, I, I listen to the podcasts. I listened to a few of them more than once because of the guests that you had and, uh, you know, I'm excited to be here. I you know I I um I definitely know you in other areas too, from whistle kick and from you know the uh, social media, meeting a person, um, few people in common together, and that kind of thing. Uh, we're both mountain boys, but <laughs> yes. uh, yeah, this this is um, I think it's overdue as well. You know, yeah. it's it's great. Well, you know, I've got. I don't know if everybody organizes information this way, but a lot of times when I think about people, I think of things like organize things in a timeline and I've got these bits for you and I know, Uh you know, certain windows into, into you, your training elements of your life. And, you know, I I know so little about the beginning. Okay. And so let's, let's just do it. Let's go there. Let's go back. And Sometimes I like this as a visual. If we okay. were, and I think you'll you'll appreciate this one more than than maybe some people. If we were going to make a comic book for your life, <laughs> right? And, and, <laughs> yeah. and it's about your journey as a martial artist. Uh, what happens in in the first issue? Okay, so yeah, that is a great intro, and it is <laughs> comic book is oh, I love it. Um, so I was that kid that actually walked down to the dime store. That's how old I am, and bought comic books when they came out in the second week of the of the month. And you know they weren't even mail order yet, and um, so that was pretty good. I you know I had when Spider Man came out. You know I was that kid that was like, oh my god, I gotta go. So, but um, first issue would be. A young boy uh, in the inner city, and um, it was in uh, Britain, Connecticut, and Bristol, Connecticut. Went back and forth. My parents split up when I was young, and um, my father thought it was a good idea that I would, you know, get some kind of training. I was fairly athletic, so I was playing baseball and uh, midget football and that kind of thing. And then one day, the local boys' club used to take in the kids after school and then parents would pick you up when they got out of work, whether that'd be five, six o'clock, that kind of thing, and then go home. And that was, you know, kind of a, I guess today they call that like a lock key thing or a latch key thing, but it was all the boys in the area had the boys club and the girls club was down the road and they did very similar. And you would play basketball and go swimming and, uh, organized volleyball, uh, indoor baseball, all that kind of stuff. Well, one day I turned around and this, you know, I don't know how else to word it, but a very handsome um, young African American kind of gives me a shove. And I turned around, this is six foot, 200 pounds, solid muscle guy. He says, Hey, you. And I went, Me? He said, Listen, you're fairly athletic. I like how you move in. Would you want to try some Kung Fu? And I was like, you mean like the movies and that kind of thing? And don't forget, Kung Fu was on TV then. Um, so as as a series, I was about nine, ten years old. And um, he said, yeah. So he goes, come here tomorrow. So I went to the first class and fell in love. And he was one of Griffin's Iron Dragons, you know, the famous Kempo school. He was a student of Ian Griffin. And um, and I started my Kung Fu right there and at the boys club going every day after school. And um, and I and I loved it 
from day one. And then um, that would be the first issue would be that kind of thing. It was uh, for a boys club event. It was fairly organized. Uh, more and a lot more organized than what I had at home, that's for sure. And um, but that's that's where it started. That was the first love, and he was a cross trainer before there was such a thing. I mean, we did not only kung fu, but we did some uh, kento karate. We did some judo. Uh, he was a military guy, so we did some kind all kinds of calisthenics, and he really was very hard disciplined. But a but a great guy, and that was for a good five years, six years until I was, um, you know, well into high school. So that that would be the first issue. Now you said that your father wanted you to have some training. Yeah. So was so, were, was was there a conversation where he said, you know, I want you to do this? Like, well, like what's What's dad was it? um no to put it bluntly dad dad was a biker um was in in the in that light one percenter lifestyle and he just wanted his kids kind of tough and i wasn't i was athletic but i was also a bookworm and kind of sickly and i wasn't as strong as you know maybe he would have liked and that kind of thing mm. but he also thought that i would be really good at you know um, at the Kung Fu type or karate, martial art, um, chop suey, he would call it, you know, that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> so that was a tough old Irishman. I mean, he was old school. Mom was Native American. So um, there was a, some culture clashes at times there. But uh, they both agreed that the, um, the discipline would have done me well. I had like zero fear as a kid. I was... One of those kids. Matter of fact, um, I was actually told this story today in uh, my I I teach a gym class at uh, at a local private school up here. And when I was about nine nine years old, we went to the Catskill Game Farm, and they had these you know the animals there, and people were feeding the giraffes, and the giraffes had their head over the fence, and I, they would never allow this today. And I had like a waffle cone, so I'm feeding the giraffe, and I'm thinking in the back of my head, I want to hug this thing. So I bring the waffle cone closer to my chest. The giraffe puts his head down. I put my arms around the giraffe to give it a hug, and this thing lifts its head up. And there I go. <laughs> Boom! Straight up into the air. People are freaking out. There's cameras going. You can hear it, you know. And and my father just goes, oh, there's my kid. So he walks underneath here, and he goes, Tommy, let go. And I let go and he catches me. So, but that, that was, you know, I, I, my poor mother. Uh, so. and, and, and there's the cover. There's the cover yeah. of the first issue is you hanging off the ground, dangling from the yeah. of a giraffe. So, you know, um, and that was me. You know, I had, you know, um, my poor mother. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, God bless her. I don't know how she did it. But that was, that was me. I, you know, so, um, the, the, the training really, they thought would help. My dad, you know, was, you know, Vietnam era. So um, the, that kind of, you know, the judo was already well rooted and um, Kung Fu was coming back, karate and Taekwondo was taking a really good foothold in the country. So it was, you know, it was also the right time as well where martial arts was, you know, gaining popularity. It was a good alternative. Um, and it, and it welcomed anybody. That was the thing too. In baseball, you couldn't catch the ball right away. You got cut, you know, in football, if you, if you, um, you know, would but drop the ball and didn't like defense or didn't like get hit, you know, you didn't play. It was, you know, um, different world back then. You know, they, you know, a lot of kids got cut from teams that probably should have got a lot of tries where martial arts didn't do that. You know, you, you know, we said it this morning, right? The best advice I ever got was see your next class. You know, no matter what, you know, shape you were in, physically, emotionally, mentally, um, spiritually, you're welcome to that next class. And I don't really know too many avenues where that's true, um, where a such a dichotomy of people can fit in in one room right. from different backgrounds, you know. 
So even the church is not that diverse in many areas where as a martial arts school. I mean, martial arts school, you could be sitting next to a millionaire's kid and the other one could be, you know, working three jobs to, to pay rent, you know, and you're, and you're equal. At that point, you're friends. You're hanging out. You're getting sweaty together. You're bleeding together. You're working, you know. Um, somebody come against your school at a tournament. Did not, you know, that was like brother. It was a real brother. So um, that that kept me there, too. And dad thought that was good for me, and he was right. He was definitely right. Now, you put a, a, a time stamp on it. You said four or five years or so. Yeah. Like you said until you were well into high school. Uh, did something change at that point? Yeah, a couple of things changed. I I was going back and forth between Connecticut and Vermont. Like I said, my parents were um, uh, divorced, and I found myself in a little town in Terryville, Connecticut. And you know, I lost my school. You know, it was uh, quite a distance, and um, while I was driving, I didn't have a car yet. Uh, so, but I was, and there's a lot of things I've done. I boxed for the police athletic league as a kid. Um, I wrestled and that kind of thing. So in high school, I went out for the wrestling team and, um, you know, ended up being captain of the team and I was pretty good and that kind of thing. But I was still something missing. And then I met a, another teacher that taught in the next town over, but he was willing to um, get me ride shares to get to those classes. So then I started Kenpo Karate. And um, it was more on the Kenpo side, the Kung Fu side, um, but he was an Ed Parker student. So the journey changed at that point. And um, I was in that for quite a while until I graduated high school. And that was, that was a lot of fun. And then I moved out to California, went to college, dropped out of college, <laughs> became a lifeguard in a beach bum. And then I, I looked up another Kenpo school and an Aikido school out there. And that was um, that experience that came in from that. So I was already starting a, a plethora of different arts and trying to get well-rounded. And um, it was getting pretty good. And I loved it. it was, I could not get enough. And for a while there, I was working to pay for my lessons. And then I worked out with different teachers where I could work at the school and help pay for, you know, my teaching and that kind of thing. And uh, that's when I started working with the kids too at that age. And I was young. So that was, that was, that was life for me in there. That would be issue two, for sure. That, that whole change there. And it happened fairly rapidly with, you know, within four or five years, because from, you know, 15 or so as a freshman in high school, to you know college age you know and that that's a quick time in your life anyway so that that was that and then then i did that for quite a while and then um for ha-has I, I played minor league baseball for a little while but uh you know i knew i wasn't gonna make it to the big show in that <laughs> no way so the other thing i had going for me was my speed but then um I, for Hahas, I tried out, when I came back home, I tried out for the East Coast demo team and I made it. So next thing you know, I'm traveling doing martial arts, you know, getting paid to work out six hours a day. It was phenomenal. That was, that was a good time. Tell, tell us about that team. I, I, you know, I've, I've heard the name, but I, I honestly, I can't place, I don't think I could say anything about it other than I've heard of it. Okay, so the East Coast Devil team was a was a mixed match. Uh, Chuck Merriman actually coached it for a little while. I know you've heard of him. Mm -hmm. um, and he was wonderful. Uh, Billy Blanks was on the team for a little short time. Um, Steve Anderson was on it. You know, it was one of those teams that guys went to when they wanted to learn and see other arts. And we traveled all over from little gyms to stadiums. And that was at the time when a lot of other teams are in their full glory. Uh, you had the Paul Mitchell team go in. You had the, Bud, the Budweiser team go in. And there was a lot of teams that never made the upper echelon, but had people that did, you know, spend time there. Hmm. Um, and that was wonderful about it as well. 
And I got to learn how to, you know, be competitive in any kind of tournament imaginable. And I tried it. I was that daredevil. I would go to a BBJ tournament and get killed. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, 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 I wanted to learn how to fight against that. I'd go to a Taekwondo tournament and people were trying to get me the full equipment because I didn't know a chest protector or <laughs> headgear. I mean, I had a mouth guard and a belt was our, you know, and hand sparring gear and that kind of thing. Um, I had shin pads, but you know, there were people going, Hey, you want to do this? I want to do this. Okay. Well, let's get you some gear, you know, and people would come together and do that. And, and I was very competitive. I mean, I was the guy that took my sparring gear and put it in the, in the ice chest to harden it up so that, <laughs> first shot with this thing um but i remember like for example like when i went to the taekwondo tournament um and i did pretty good not knowing the art or or and learning the rules in the first couple of matches really quick and and i'm not saying i won because i didn't but um i remember like a few like one thing um specifically was even though I blocked the shot in a typical Bagua type hand up, other hand down block when the kick was coming, the guy would land it. Now it wasn't a point because he hit me in the upper arm, but I'd go flying. Mm. Or, or it would hurt and leave a mark, you know, and I didn't want to get hit with that again. Type of feeling like, okay, that, that nice shot. You, you grin and smile and say, yep, you got me. But I was thinking, okay, I have to learn a way to fight against this thing or I'm going to have a dislocated shoulder by the end of the weekend because <laughs> I was just doing the normal absorb block that, that you do in Kung Fu, you know, mm-hmm. or, or just kind of, you know, try to parry it a little bit. So you're not getting the full force. Let's face it though. When that front kick is coming, whether it's the ball of his foot or the heel, because you parried it a little bit, <laughs> it's still going to hurt. So, um, Sam Goleno. So that was um how how that happened. So um I ended up taking Taekwondo lessons for about six months just to learn how to be able to not get hit with that thing. Mm. So that was how all that came about. And the team really embraced that kind of thing. We had a Nikito guy there and you know, that was fun. And I took some Akito lessons. So we used to play. And, um, you know, and then, of course, you had the guys that were really, really good and that you couldn't stand a chance against. I mean, when you're facing, you know, Steve Anderson, yeah. uh, you know, just the fact that your coach, you're like, really? You want me to go in there and hit this guy and come out alive? You know, and he knew it. And he would grin and smile, you know, and just say, listen, we're going to have fun. Um, you know, I got hit by a Billy Blank sax kick. That wasn't fun, no. you know. Um, no, I no, think not. No, but you know, on the other hand, he's a really good guy, and you know, and afterward, you start talking to these guys. They're just like you and I. Um, they just want to play, and um, you know, they have some athletic ability that you know I didn't have, obviously, um, and skills maybe doing it a little bit longer because you know they're a little older than I am. But it was it was fun, and I learned a lot, you know. And and then you see, I mean, what, you know, this was during the time period where you know Chuck Norris would show up and sign autographs and 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 show off a little bit and play. You know, Cynthia Rothrick was still competing back then. You know, because Shimbani was still competing back then. So you, you know, you got to meet some of these people, and um, and through that team, you know, I was on the middle of the light team for a little while. Um, didn't really care for that because it was really hyped competitive, you know, and go, 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 go. But I did have the opportunity to travel. I mean, I can, I can honestly say I've been in a tournament in just about every state in the union plus Canada, Mexico, you know, it, it, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. And that's where I met the, um, you know, in the next stage, you know, I met some of the security people that got me in involved in some stuff and um that was that was pretty cool so um so you you stepped out of competition and you went into private security Security. yeah i i was i worked for a big rock and roll promoter for quite a few years and i did a lot of concerts and my job was the guy that 
if they got past the football player size guys was to make sure they didn't reach the talent. Mm. And I was, you know, I can say, say nobody ever reached the talent. I wasn't tested that often, but it happened. Um, but because I'm unassuming and I'm not very big and I blended right in, you know, I was the guy they weren't looking for. So, and I would be able to, you know, mit, you know, redirect them as they would say, and not to reach the stage. And, um, and through that, I, you know, I, I had jobs with like Burns International Security and did um, some nuclear work for that kind of thing, you know, high end uh, security for those places that work for Pinkerton, Wells Fargo. Mm -hmm. um, it was good stuff. So it was pretty cool. And um, did that for quite a while. Then I was found myself teaching the Connecticut State Correction Officers and and state police. And so my training got enhanced there. And um, then then I started the internal journey right about then. This was probably the early 90s. And that's when I started focusing, realizing that I can't do the hard stuff forever. And by this time, I've already been diabetic for 20 years. So that started creeping up on me. And I was, um, so I went to school as a lineman and uh, became a lineman. and taught on the side and taught a few schools, kids' classes and that kind of thing. And I started taking personal lessons. Um, you should probably clarify. There's probably, okay. a, there may be some people listening for whom the term oh. lineman means football. Oh, no. No, I'm not, no. <laughs> I know what no. you mean. Yeah, I would have been destroyed. No, I was an, <laughs> I was an electrical lineman. Sure. Um, mostly low voltage, but I did everything. Uh, but I did a lot of cable TV, uh, a lot of fiber, um, a lot of telephone and, and, um, and primary, uh, and secondary electrical as well. I was licensed to do everything, but I was in the union and most of the contractors that we got that would hire me were, um, the cable companies or, you know, that kind of thing. So, and, um, I, I spent a lot of years doing fiber and telephone wires when digital first hit, you know, cause the internet was new and all that had to come up. So there was a lot of work in that. And I did a lot of um, storm duty as well. Uh, so, I mean, I was up in Vermont for Irene, you know, I was down in Texas and Florida when those hurricanes hit and did a lot of work. So um, that was on that part. And then the internal, to be clear, was I started in the Silent Dragon and Black Dragon Kung Fu. And um, and since I was already into Kempo a lot, it wasn't a hard transition for me to uh, to go full on with that. And that's why I started learning Tai Chi and more of the Kung Fu stuff. And this is what pretty much what I teach today. And um, I teach Aikido as well because I earned a, a pretty decent rank in that as well. But um, the soft styles is kind of what I, for lack of a better term, go for. Although in my school, all ranks and all styles are welcome and everybody plays. So if somebody comes in, for example, at the Black Belt and Shotokan Karate, you know, we'll, we'll entertain that and work with that and then do blending, what I like to call, uh, so or concepts. And that always becomes fun. Because my students, you know, they, you know, when you're doing, you know, animal forms, they're fun. They're kind of cool, but you know, they don't realize does it work or not. And so you bring in somebody like that, and they realize, wait a minute, they got some stuff that's pretty cool, but we got stuff that's pretty cool. Can we combine them? And I'm like, this is where you're learning. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that's how that went. And plus, I had to earn a living. I mean, I really wasn't earning a good living in security. It was such a, I mean, to get shot at for $12 an hour wasn't, wasn't any fun. So. No, it, maybe, maybe if it was like 18, 20. Yeah. That'd yeah, be worthwhile, maybe, but. Yeah. Not so, while we've been you know, alive. I, I, that's what I said to my boss. They're like, you know, I've been shot at twice. I don't like this. You know, this isn't fun. So, um, you know, yes, I'd live to tell about it, but again. You know, if they were really trying to kill me, they probably would have succeeded, you know, so. <laughs> so, yeah, there's not enough money in the back of this van for me really want to, you know, just lay it all down. 
So, and the first thing they tell you is that, you know, leave the money and leave. But, I mean, why are you an armed guard? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and then for the, the Department of Defense jobs, you know, then you realize that you're not leaving. That, that was a whole different scenario. <clears throat> so, if they were really coming over that fence, they, they would implode the plant before they ever let those secrets get out. Mm. So, wow. <clears throat> but yeah, I wasn't for me, you know, so. <laughs> I, I want to. I want to talk about all these different styles you've trained and not, not, not the style okay. specifically, but the approach, because there are a couple things that are going on here. And one, you, you acknowledge this when you talked about your first instructor, the idea that cross training was not really a thing people did. And sometimes they did, but they didn't use that word because, That's right. you, you know, back then, you, 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 if I've got my math right, you started ahead of me. I started in 83. And back then, there were kind of two schools of thought. We either did what that style said to the letter, or it was, we're going to take everything we can possibly get our hands on. There was, I, I, I was aware of nothing in the middle. Right. So, and, well, I, yeah, I roughly started around 1970. Um, so, uh, you know, a decade ahead of you. And, but yet, the same school of thought was still in place. Maybe even stricter in the seventies. I don't know. Yeah, from my uh, understanding uh, yeah. and from the guests we've had on the show, that open mentality was even less common right. in your conventional schools. Maybe maybe in the in the competition world because people were always trying to get a leg up, but that wasn't that wasn't where you were then. Right, you were in a school school. Right. So um, the first school I went to was the Kempo School, which already starts out. I mean, you trace its roots as a kung fu karate blend. Right. So the the approach of of Kali Griffin, the you know Griffin's Iron Dragons, was that you take this and realize there's a hard and soft way of doing this. So in that sense, um, I I obviously had a very open minded set of teachers and a system that, that I started out in. And that helped a lot. However, I run back then, and then even to this day, I, ran, I run into, well, we do this. Well, how come you don't do that? That's what they do. Or what you do won't work against this. Or I have a prejudice against that style because they, do, they don't do this or they only do that. And I always find that when you run into that, that's, and I really hate to say it, but somebody who really didn't do their homework. Mm -hmm. Because when you really start looking into the arts and into the forms particularly, and the root systems, you see that the blending always took place. I mean, how did Kung Fu start? It was some monk looking at an animal saying, you know what? I think I can use this. Um, and blending that into human form. I mean, listen, they're named after animals for, for heaven's sake, right? You get crane, tiger, um, and all these things, dragon. You know, though dragon's mythological, it's still a presence that takes on. When you start doing dragon form, you start thinking mythological creature. You're, it's a majesty about it when you do that form. There's a gracefulness that only comes with that. When you do tiger, you can't help but get fierce. When you do mantis, you know, your personality will change to an aggressive type striking. It's mantis kung fu. So when blending in that, what I always tried to strive for was if karate's lasted this long, it's got to have a good foundation. And you can build any house on system with a good foundation. If judo's lasted that long, why? Um, there's a lot of flash in the pan martial arts that come through. They don't last. And um, the good ones do. And there's reasons for that. And I think when you cross-train and blend and try to understand their concept and, and approach, it makes you a, not only a better martial artist, but a, a better person overall because you're placing yourself on their dojo, their kwan, 
their hardwood floor, their mats, you know, and, you know, when I, when I teach, I, I don't, I say this all the time. There's no such thing as a bad art, only bad artists, you know, and if you ran into a bad artist, I'm sorry, you know, I apologize. I'll give you a hug. Um, my, you know, I, I can't say I'm going to give you the money back because I teach for free. So, but um, you're going to walk away with a caliber of saying, you know what? Uh, we went through this. I mean, we looked at it from every measure. Um, and there's a lot of forms when you start breaking them down. They're very similar across the arts. I mean, when you start looking at a Tang Soo Do versus a karate, yep, it's different. You can see the differences, but you can see this, you know, the similarities as well. Um, Kung Fu is more circular. But when you break that block down, is it really that different than a parry block in karate? Right? Or your five-star combination in Kempo, is it really that different? Sure. It may be quicker, stronger, harder, uh, more external versus internal in those senses where you're, where you're, you know, you're trying to, you know, cut off and and break and stop, or in Kung Fu, you're doing more blending and pulling, pushing. Um, but is it really that different? You know, you're learning how to fight. Let's get realistic here. Not that you want to fight, but it, it's a martial art. And um, so that's why we do a lot of weapons in my class, too. Um, because weapons really brings out the beauty that is the art. And you learn pretty quickly too when you're doing it wrong because it's not going to work. You know, when, when the other person on the other side has a nice boken, you know, ready to tap your ribs, you realize, okay, that black didn't work. <laughs> so, you know, or you're doing collie sticks and your forearms are black and blue. Well, yeah, I, I think I need to do this differently, you know? So, but I, I, I appreciate that question because you're right. Um, the walls that I have, come across and it's kind of heartbreaking to be honest with you i don't get frustrated anymore because i realize it's just their point of view and um it doesn't have to be that way i think the arts should be more sharing and more open to one another i think there should be more people that are willing to you know if you don't understand taekwondo then go take it for six months learn it what are you afraid of um if you don't understand Kung Fu or you don't really think it's for good self-defense, I heard that many times, yeah, come take my class for six months and see if you're, you know, learning anything practical that you can use that will save your life. You know, I would, I would bet to say you will. I mean, one of the strongest things I teach is to turn fear into curiosity. And if you're fearful about something, ask yourself why. Get curious about it. If it's an ego thing, well, then drop your ego a little bit and figure it out. If it's if your art is truly superior, then what are you afraid of? Hmm. You know, if the rest is all junk, what are you afraid of? Come try it. You know, prove me that it, my stuff is junk. You know, not me personally, but I mean, you know, in general, you know, prove that score that it's junk. Go check them out. You don't know. Um, you know, for example, like Krav Maga, like you hear a lot of criticism about it from all the different schools. Not realizing that, you know, when the Israelis trained, they're in full battle gear. They got full riot gear on. And, you know, a lot of people say, oh, that front crash block wouldn't work in real life. Really? If you're willing, you got a bulletproof vest on and arm pads and a face shield, that block is not only going to work, it's going to drop you out of your behind quicker than you can know what to do with. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, dude, you're going to be looking up at that guy real quick who's now got a PR-24 on your throat. The stuff works, um, you know, and, and they do it to truly daily to save their lives, you know. Um, and I don't want to get into a political discussion on, you know, Israeli self-defense, but let's be honest here. There are people out there in the world that would like to see that country off the face of the earth. It's, you know, it's yeah. that simple. Um, and, I, and again, I don't mean to get emotional or be political about that, um, but it's true. And, um, you know, and I have a lot of pride in a lot of areas. I mean, I'm, I'm half Native American, so I understand being a kid when your teacher walks in and says, you know, you're running around like a bunch of wild Indians. And I look up and say, well, my aunts told me it was the other way around. 
you know, or if you called an Indian giver, oh, wait a minute, whose land was whose? So, and I kid about it now because I realize, you know, I, I can't change history and I can't change the way somebody was brought up not knowing any better. But I can change my heart in the point of, you know what? I understand why you said that. I understand why you call it a paddy wagon. You know, my other side is Irish. <laughs> but chase the roots of those comments and understand, you know, there are times in this world where people just don't like each other. And, you know, I, I try to change that one person at a time. You know, there, you know, I, I that's why my school, another reason why my school is free. It's an outreach. Because I think that it's not that I am getting better at Kung Fu now. Kung Fu is making me a better person. You know, I'm able to grow in those areas. And one of them is embracing other people, other lifestyles, other cultures. And, you know, that's over the last 10 years. I wasn't always that way. You know, as a kid, I was pretty hard headed, um, sensitive, but didn't really care to see someone else's point of view necessarily. But the last, you know, 10, 15 years that that's changed. Um, you know, and I, and can you name a better place than other than a martial arts school where you're going to get all those cultures in one spot? I True. Can't. I can't, you know, without bias, you know, or without an agenda. I mean, our agenda in a martial arts school is like, Hey, I want to learn how to do that. It's kind of cool. Right. You know, as young boys, you learn to learn martial arts for two reasons. Either you want to learn how to fight or pick up girls. You know, that changes quickly once you're in there. But that's usually a motivation for a 20 year old guy, um, which is fine. But when you break it all down and, and get to know one another, it, it really is. I can't think of a better place, you know, and, you know, you know me a little bit. I'm a God-fearing guy. I, I go to church. Um, but, you know, even in those religious aspects, there's an agenda at times, and I'm not afraid to, to admit that. There is also a prejudice sometimes, you know, like I'm not welcome there, you know. And there's an old church joke that I think applies to martial arts too. You know, the devil is crying on the church steps of, the, of a famous church. And... Jesus walks up to him and says, dude, why are you crying? And the devil looks at him and goes, they won't let me in there. And Jesus said, well, they won't let me in there either. So, you know, um, again, not to make this a religious thing, because it's not, but when, you, when, you're not a, when you're not afraid to look in someone else's eyes and let them pull what's in your eye that's stopping you from seeing, the world would be a better place. And, uh, you know, a martial arts school is the only place that I know of where no matter who walks in that door, you're welcomed. And they really want you to come back to the next class. You know, if you're not welcomed in a martial arts school, you messed up somewhere. Mm. You know, that's on you. That's, you a, know? That's, a, that's, a bold, that's a bold statement. And yet, you know, Andrew and I were recording earlier today and we, we uh -huh. talked about some stuff kind of along those lines. And so that that's hit me kind of kind of hard in, in a yeah. exactly. So, and, and the dog agrees that you're right. <laughs> that, right. Let me walk away from the dog. Um, so, so it's so rare that for the sake of, of the interview. Of yes, go ahead. That's a bold statement. It's, it's and, rare that. You know, I've trained in a lot of different schools and, and I can count on less than one hand over the decades I've been training the number of people who have been asked to not come back. It's a very small right. list. Um, it is. And, and it's usually not for a martial art reason. Right. You know, um, and again, and, and I don't mean to be callous in that at all. But for example, if you've got a guy in there that's in there, you know, let's just be honest here. I, and um, is not there for the right reasons and is dated, you know, 15 out of 16 women in your class, you know what? Um, you might want to talk to him about, you know, a character issue there. Um, or maybe he's hurting other people on purpose. You know, maybe he has a, a real anger problem and you've asked him to tone it down. Maybe ask him to step out of sparring class for a little while and they don't want to do it, you know? 
Um, so I've never seen somebody get turned away for financial reasons. I've never seen anybody get turned away for um, trying to be better. I've never seen anybody get turned away for physical reasons. I mean, we've all seen the kid in the wheelchair taking martial arts, you know, and got happy with it. So if you're not asked to come back to class, you know, that that's usually, you know, a character issue that someone has to work out. And you know what? I've seen people come back and and accept it as well when they work certain things out. Um, and that's good too. You know, I've seen people get not asked to come to a one or two classes for, say, a substance thing. Um, you know, maybe they stopped on the way to the class and had that one too many. Sure. Hey, you might want to sit this one out a little bit. But, you know, um, I've never, I've, you know, very, very few have, um, as I have not asked to come back. And then the few that I have seen within a, with a sincere apology and a life change, um, they have come back. You know, it's the change in us that's going to change people around you. You know, mm. there's, there's a, there's a point when, you know, People who always teach her, how do I start working on myself? Well, stop expecting other people to change would be a, a good first step. Um, if you really don't like some, something as somebody else, you got to ask yourself why. What, what is it about that person that really bugs me? And if it's something silly, like the way they raise their eyebrow or something, that's on you. You know, you're, you know it's okay to have pet peeves because pet peeves gives you the absolute right to complain about something that's not important at all. Just make sure they don't bite somebody else. You know, if you have a pet peeve, for example, that you always spread your peanut butter first before you put jelly on it, that's on you. If somebody makes you a sandwich and they do it the opposite way, you're going to reject it now because your pet peeve was to do it this certain way in an order. You know, when you're on that unflexible, um, no, that, that's a character issue within that person himself. And I'm not saying that's good, bad, or different, but you have to recognize that's you. Um, but you don't have to hang out with that person. You don't have to associate with that person. And no one's asking you to, you know, walk hand in hand and be great friends either. But um, if you really love somebody and you want to see dynamic radical change, then do something radical and realize it's you radically need to change. You know, um, a lot of people want to make a new radical martial art. Well, then do something radical. How about training something else for a while? Completely different than what you're doing. You find people that, for example, well, I've taken karate, like say, well, it's just because they're both popular, Shotokan karate for 10 years, and you're really good. Um, so you want to try something else, so you go to Ishan Ru. How much did you really change? Yep, you, get, you learned a couple of new forms. The stanzas are a little different, maybe a little deeper. Um, the meaning may be a little different from the context of, of coming at it. But if you really want radical change from Shotokan Karate, you know, try Kaparada mm. or Kala, right, or Sila. You know, do something that's going to radically change the way you approach things and then blend them together. You know, when you see somebody who's really good in karate, all of a sudden they can go into a soft bow stance and change. And now you don't know where their balance or point of attack is coming. That's beautiful. That's art. You know, when you see a guy that's been doing kung fu for a really long time and all of a sudden they can do some hard blocks and do a triangle move in or put you in an arm bar that you ain't getting out of, that's beauty. Because you know they didn't learn that in their school. You know that they, they had to step out of their comfort zone in order to apply a new application. Um, you know, I love it when like a, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu guy would come into my school and they come in with a single leg takedown and then I cross face and go around them. Mm -hmm. Whoa, wait, I didn't expect that. You're a Kung Fu guy. You're going to want to stand up. You're right. I do want to stand up. I don't like this. But you, since you came in on me, I'm not silly and, and stay there and let you take my leg out, you know, and put me in a triangle hole. Not going to happen. 
Um, if you get it, you earned it, then fine. I'll tap out and you earned it. No big deal, right? This is how you learn. So, um, but don't think, for example, say if you're in one style all the time and this is your, the thing you always land, if you think other styles are not trained against that one thing, then you really are naive. You know, if your art thinks you're the only one that you could do something, then that's naive. And it's immature, really, because all the other arts train against that thing that's coming at them. That's what forms are for. Like, why do you do your forms in your kata? It's because you're, you're imaginary, a fighter coming at you that's unconventional. Different than what is coming at you for. That's what makes sword play so great. Because, you know, when even with a boken, if you mess up, you're you're gonna feel it. You're gonna know it. Um, Kendo is awesome for that as well. You learn your mistakes really quick, and it doesn't matter what the rank is the person in front of them. Matter of fact, you want higher rank because they tend to have better control. They're not gonna boink you in the head. So, however. You get that one person in there that you know, maybe has some natural ability. You know you're gonna you're gonna use what works, but if you go through the same thing all the time. They're gonna figure it out. You know, a lot of styles are built to counter other styles. Um, we have a form in Chinese kung fu, the five animal form, where the first whole twelve moves are up against a a military style aggressive fighter. They're all blocks for either a sword to the face or, or a punch, you know, or a stabbing type thing. And even though they're based out of animals, they were made to intercept, you know, the, the Japanese coming on them. So um, you don't forget the Asian wars go back centuries. And, you know, a lot of those arts were developed because it was a, you know, a feudal sense of, of how they lived. It was a martial world. And I mean, that's where the clans came from, right? That's where the families came from. That's where you talk about, I'm sure you've talked about lineage all the oh, time. Well, where does your lineage come from, right? Well, you know, some farmers said I had enough. <laughs> Basically. Well, yeah, right? that, that's, yeah, that's a very succinct <laughs> yeah. and apt answer. Yeah. You know, some farmer had enough that this pitchfork is going in your throat, bro. I'm sorry. I had enough. Um, you know, a lot of people say like size were hay balers. Well, if that's the point, that's a pretty nice weapon now, right? Numpchucks were oxen holders. Well, if they were yoke holders, you know, well, guess what? Um, you know, getting something swung at you like that, you don't want to be in front of that. No, no nobody know? wants um, that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, nobody. I mean, I, I've even hit myself by accident. You know, I, like, I, okay, I, I, I would, I would guess if there was a way to, to. <laughs> study the the number of hits nunchaku have yeah yeah scored in the last yeah. decade 99 percent of them have been against the person holding them yeah. usually in the back yeah. of the head yeah just look at the back of my elbow right but you know or the back yeah i mean um but eye hand coordination it's a fun you know fun thing to learn uh it's a you know would i use it on the street no um you know, I'd rather use a cane if I had to and pretend that I was crippled, you know, whatever. But, um, and that's the other thing too. Like I never go to an airport. I also, I, I get a limp and a cane when I, when I walk through an airport. Um, cause they're not going to take your cane away from you. So, so you might, you know, um, there's always things you want to think about in that martial point of view. Um, and you want to stay legal, right? You want to stay healthy. You want to stay, Within the right side of the law, you know, a lot of a lot of places you can't carry them, Chuck. At least when I was a kid, you couldn't. Um, you know, but you you can have a stick in your hand, right? So Kali works. Um, you know, and then you always hear the sayings too, like if you're gonna carry a baseball bat, make sure there's a ball and glove in your trunk as well. Your lawyer will thank me later. You know that kind of stuff you hear all the time in the martial art room and. That's fine. It's funny. But realistically, do you ever even really want to go there? Um, you know, I'm one of those guys that would much rather, uh, you know, buy you a, a beer or a soda or a cup of coffee than to continue this argument. You know, I, 
So, you know, I'm working security. I've seen things escalate quick. Um, but that's, you know, never good, you know? So, and that's where you want to reach out, in my opinion. You know, and try to change. What was it about me that you don't like? You know, can, can I change that? Well, what can I do? You know, we got to work together for the next five years on this, you know, on this line crew, like when I was a lineman. And it was a, if there's a personality conflict, I would be, listen, dude, we're going to work together and, we're, you know, we're going to need each other and our lives are going to depend on it. What is it about me that you don't like? You know, my hair color, you know, my blue jeans are as blue as yours. You wear the same boots. You know, and you figure it out. And you know what? Usually you end up becoming good friends after that conversation. Maybe not the first time. Maybe not the second. Maybe the tenth, though, you realize, you know, what what it was. And it's usually something minor. You know, um, I actually had a guy not like me because of my lisp. You know, how trivial is that? Now he's a good friend of mine. Well, how did you yeah. convert that? Well, um, I asked him, I said, dude, what is it about? He goes, when you talk, you drive me nuts. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, you, well, you have, you know, oh, my speech impediment that I've been in speech therapy since I was five years old. Be that thing? And then he looked at me and said, I know. I said, when I talk fast or after a couple of beers, it really shows up. Um, it doesn't bother me anymore. But, you know, for some reason it bothered him. And I don't know why. Um, and then we, after talking, we found out that, you know, his stepmother, who wasn't very nice to him, had a speech impediment. And it was just one of those root causes that caused him to trigger. You know, it was a trigger for him every time he heard it. And, um, but we became good friends after that. And, you know, a lot of conversations, a lot of working through it. Uh, you know, I was, I was his boss for a little bit. So I said, listen, you're going to have to like me or not. You know, you're getting your check off from me on Wednesday. And if you're not doing a good job because you're pissed at me, it, you know, I'm going to have to tell our steward, you know, I was in a union and, uh, no, he always did a good job though. And he showed up to work at time. He just didn't care for me for a while. And then after a while, he realized, you know what? It's not you. you it's just a trigger for me and I got to work with it. And he did. Um, and then he ended up becoming a, a Kung Fu student of mine for a little while, too. So that worked out well. I mean, it hurt when he said it, you know, because it brought up, like, you know, why would someone not like me? Because I don't speak well in his mind. But um, in the end, it's, it's all, it's fine. And it was the change in me approaching it is what, you know, changed him to bring that back up again. You know, mm. so... Yeah, I got deep quick, huh? It did. <laughs> what happens when I get out of the way? You just you just run with it and you take us yeah. to some fun places. So, um, well, you know, as you you know, when we take on students as martial artists, and um, or you submit yourself as a student as a martial artist, there's an enduring or should be moment somewhere in that. I mean, Sifu is an enduring, or endearing, I should say, uh, connotation, meaning, you know, teacher, friend, uncle. Um, you know, there's a respect, but there's also a, a loving connotation that goes with that. And, and I, you know, as, as sensei as well, is like, you know what, I, I want to learn from you. Give me what you've got is the meanings behind all that. Suzuki, right, balance. Isn't this all about that yin and yang in, in, the, in, in Kung Fu, Suzuki, in, in the Japanese art? It's all balance. And if you don't have that teacher-student relationship in balance, and it should be in a caring, giving, pushing way, but, you know, respectable and honorable, you know, you, don't, you want to be men of integrity, women of integrity, people of integrity. Um, but in the same though, it becomes family. You know, it becomes a brotherhood, a sisterhood. It becomes somewhere where, you know, I don't care about your background. We're training. Um, we can go get pizza later and we can hang out sometimes. And because of that, 
you know, now you're, now you're developing relationships. You know, you can say, hey, that person's a friend of mine, or you can say, you know what, that person's a friend of mine. I, I know them, you know. And when you know somebody well enough to say, you know what, I don't think they would do that. Or, yeah, that sounds just like him. Or, yeah, that's something she would do. Then that brings it to another level. And martial arts is a great way to get to know somebody in that, in that manner. And you're sweating with them. You're bleeding with them. You're punching and throwing kicks at each other. You're getting into moves. You're trying joint locks and different things of one another. There's trapping going on, right? Um, listening skills has to improve or you're never going to be very good at it. If you don't know how to listen to what somebody's doing, even when they're not talking as a martial artist, you're, you're in trouble because you're going to get hit with something you didn't expect to get hit with. Right? You have to watch the shoulder drop, right? The elbow rise, the knee move, the mm-hmm. toe turns in, right? You see somebody rolling to the, their, the ball of their feet. You know, in Kung Fu, if they start to root, you know, they're not going nowhere. You know, there's there's stuff, you know, in judo, if you feel somebody root, next thing you know, the floor is hitting you in the head, right? So, you know, that's all listening. That's with, and they're not talking, but yet their body's speaking loudly. And you have to kind of pick that up. You know, if you see a Taekwondo person, you know, and you see that hip start to move, even though, you know, it's not moving much, you know. You know, watch, watch <laughs> get, out. Get right? out of the way. Watch, get, just get out of the way. Yeah. Right. Don't, there's no backing up far enough. Right? You need to sidestep and run because you know you can. They, they're they're ready to chamber, and once in chamber, that's it. It's locked and loaded, and it's going to go. And even if you block it, like we talked about earlier, and, and it hits you, it's going to leave a mark. Right. And it's supposed to leave a mark. So. You know, it's doing its job. And I always giggle when I see that because, I, you know, I've over the years, I've learned to know when, all right, this guy, it's, you know, he wants to knock me back four feet. Um, and, you know, and sometimes I catch it. Sometimes I don't. You know, some people are quick enough to get that off. And, you know, and then I laugh because it's like, you know, you got me. That's cool. You know, you give him a quick bow and you go back at it again, you know. Um, and, and then you start learning the person, how they move that hit. Right. I'm sure you do it differently than the person next to you, depending on, you know, which way you are, you know, body chemistry, sure. chemicals, sure. what you want to give out, what you don't. Um, but no, when the ball of that hip is starting to rotate in any direction, you, you need to get out of the way. But, you, you know, I don't care how strong, big or tough you are. You get hit with that kick. Even if it's blocked, it's going to hurt. It's, it's supposed to hurt. It's, it's, it's hurt. meant to. <laughs> right. Right. It's good. Yeah. But that thing comes out of chamber. It's, you know, it's a human bullet hitting you in the side of the head, you know, or the shoulder or, or your hip. You're, I mean, I, you, you're get kicked in the hip. It's like, you know, it's it more than you feel like it here. should. Yeah. It's, you know, I, I want to, I want to dig into something. I okay. Dig into something. Cause we, we, you know, I'm, I'm watching the time and I want to be aware of your time and our time over sure. here. But you gloss, glossing over isn't the right word, but you, you touched on something and you moved on. And I want to go back to it because I think it's important. We've talked about this in a variety of different ways with different guests over the years. And I love getting this feedback because regardless of what we train, why we train, how we train, there are very, there are a few universal experiences in our martial arts journey. And one uh-huh. of them is that we all get older. Yeah, uh, I have not met anyone who's been able to freeze their body in time. I'm doing the best I can, but even I'm getting <laughs> older, yeah. uh, despite my efforts. And you talked about what you term this, you didn't use the word transition, but I will, from hard to soft, external to internal. Sure. And if I caught your timetable right, you've been in the midst of, or on the other side of that transition for a little while now. And I'd like you to speak to that and what a hard charging kind of rough and tumble competitive guy who was engaged in some pretty dynamic striking based arts is finding now that you're older with a different 
maybe philosophy on, if not self-defense, at least training? I love this question. And truly from all of my heart, thank you for um, bringing it back to this. You're right. I was in the transition at that point where the hard styles started catching up to me because of the training. I also was, you know, um, training to be a lineman, which is not an easy uh, job on the body as well. I was already type 1 diabetic for about 20 years at that point, which was going on my body. Um, I adopted a special needs daughter that took a lot of energy out of me. And, um, and to be honest, I was in the you know, midst of a divorce or close to that as well. So emotionally, I was not in a good spot. Um, and, it, and I was kind of like, okay, I, I know I can't keep this hard pace, the, how much I love it forever. Um, my hands got to the point where I couldn't close them anymore. I couldn't hold my pliers as a lineman. Um, arthritis started kicking in. I found myself just contemplating for 10, 15 minutes before I rolled out of bed. Um, and I, I was like, what am I going to do? So then in that transition, I went to um, uh, Sifu Steve Watson had this thing of, he called it different trees of the same forest. And um, in concept, it's kind of like free training day, but different. It was a lot more low key. Um, it was not nowhere near as organized. But the thought behind it was, let's just get together and leave the Eagles at the door and play and see what you got. So there was a guy doing headlocks there. And people were not getting out of them. And I giggled. So Ramsey's standing next to me. I don't know if you met Ramsey or not. He's a pretty good knife fighter, sea lock guy. And he looked at me, he goes, what? I said, hey, that, that wouldn't hold me. He goes, why? He said, I, I just had, if not anything else, the will not to be held that way. So Steve picked up on the conversation that we were in there having the side. And then he dictates, okay, this guy here, he didn't know me yet. Let, let him put the headlock on you. I'm like, no, I'm good. You know, I don't, I don't want to go in there. He's doing a great job. It's fine. No, no, you, dude, go in there. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm okay right here. He's doing a good job. It's his, it's his deal. It, it's fine. So then the guy says, what, you're afraid to get hurt? So I went right over there, and I assumed the ready position, for lack of a better term. He put a headlock on me, and I popped out. He tries again, I pop out of it again. He tries again, I pop out again. I said, look, you try this one more time. I'm going to fight back now instead of just popping out of it. I said, you know, this is a great move and all that. If somebody really doesn't want to be in that thing, they're going to get out. Whether it's biting you, pinching, crawling, whatever it is, they're going to get out. So then he goes, let me really sink it in. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll stop right here and you tell me when you want me to get out. Matter of fact, we'll let this guy, and I pointed to Steve Watson, the big guy. And what does the big guy say, go, when you say you're ready? Fair enough. Okay, fair enough. And this guy was a nice guy. So he gets me into this deep, deep headlock, sinks it in. You can see him pushing his hips out. He's leaning back into me. And um, I'm waiting for it. I hear Steve say, go. Now the guy, I barely can hear him because the guy's got this whole, like, this headlock absorbed into his body. So I kicked the back of his knee, put my foot right down his shin, elbowed him in the in the area that, you know, most guys don't want to get hit at. And then as he bent down, I popped my hand up and typical Kempo strike there and popped him in the mouth and I got out as I told you. So at that point, Steve brought me over and we started to play. And I don't know how long it was. Some people said it was an hour. Some people said it was 20 minutes. But whatever, when we were done playing, I escalated, he escalated, I escalated, he escalated, and he was doing stuff I'd never felt or experienced before mm. in, in, in a martial way, the way he was blocking, absorbing, and trapping. And I was hitting him in spots where he hasn't been like challenged in a long time. I, 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 
not to brag, I got pretty good hand speed and I, I know how to hit. Um, and, and I, you know, how and strike and all that. And, you know, I had some power. And um, when we stopped, everybody was just kind of staring. And that's when I met Rick Meyer. He started writing it down for like Blackout Magazine or something that, you know, this this thing that happened at this event. So then Steve pulled me aside. He goes, listen, I can tell that you're hurting in a lot of areas right now. I'm like, yeah, how could you tell that? And he's like, well, um, I've been doing this quite a while. And, you know, a lot of guys that are in pain come to me for acupuncture and, and other stuff. He goes, but just come train. And so I'm like, well, I don't know if I could fit it in. I got all this stuff. He goes, dude, just come train. Um, so I started and I started learning Tai Chi. I learned um, the internal martial arts on the slow moving, the healing processes of trying to convert all that external energy internally about balance. You know, um, again, we talked about this earlier that the balance effect, like in the Japanese arts, it's Suzuki about balance. Um, in the Chinese arts, the yin and yang principles. And I started to realize there are ways that I can move to keep moving. And after a very short period of time, I was able to close my hands again. I was able to hold a pair of pliers. I was able to just get out of bed where before I had to think about it. I just would wake up and get out of bed. I, it, it, when the first time that happened, I realized I was doing that. I'm like, well, I've done that in years. And things started loosening up. The arthritis never really completely went away, but it's so much better. And it brought me back to when I was a kid again, because when I first became diabetic, um, you know, the doctors were concerned because this is 1976. The medical field is not where it is today, especially with diabetes medications and stuff like that. I mean, when I first started taking insulin, it came from pigs and, and uh, you know, pork and beef type things. And a lot of people had allergic reactions to them. Um, to just, to just to check my sugar, I had a small chemistry lab in my bathroom because I had to boil my urine and put tablets in there and put it in a test tube and, and get it all going. Um, there was just so much. And then uh, the doctors brought my parents in and said, listen, this kid's not going to live to 30. Um, so my father's like, what do you mean? He goes, well, I think you should know that, you know, he's probably not going to live to 30 years old. Most, most kids in his physical conditions and what's going on in his body and everything generally don't, don't, you know, about a 10 year lifespan. So, um, but because I was, you know, who I was, they added a couple of extra years for whatever that meant. I didn't even know what that meant at the time. So my father says, okay, you're right. Maybe he should know, but I want you to tell him. And the doctor said, what? He goes, I want you to, you to tell him. So my father brings me to the doctors. My regular doctor, Dr. Rosenblatt, was there. And then this other doctor who I did not know. And another doctor. And he said, listen, young man, we want to tell you something. Um, you know, you're, you're intelligent, you're athletic, you're moving. But I want to let you know that you probably only have um, you know, maybe you might live to about 30 years old. And I looked that guy straight in the eye and I said, screw you, I got other plans. And the guy looked at my, and I used a different word. Mm -hmm. The guy looked, the doctor looked at my, my father. My father said, I'm not going to make him apologize for that. And my father used the same word, you know. And then I looked at my, my doctor and doctors, I know this kid. And I would not bet against him. So then that flashback brought me back to where I was. And I said, oh, you know, another transition. I have to think of things differently now. Mm -hmm. I had to think of things differently then to preserve my life because I love life. If you know me for more than 10 minutes, you know that I love life. I love people. I enjoy all things about life. I love animals. You know, I live alone on a mountain for a reason because I enjoy nature. Um, you know, I am that guy that cannot sing but will. You know, I, I, so, um, it's just who I am and I didn't want to give that up. So when I started going into the soft side of the arts, the internal arts, 
and learning how to breathe control uh, differently than external in that sense. And with Qigong, you know, and the exercises and the Tai Chi and then learning Kung Fu, which is great martial wise. So I wasn't giving up that, that some people think they're giving up in Tai Chi. But in, I learned, started learning Black Dragon, Silent Dragon, Kung Fu, and um, that whole full circle martial art wise um, started really benefiting me. I mean, there's that old saying, right? What's the best way to be a martial arts? Wait 10 years. <laughs> right? You're going to be too beat up. I haven't heard right? that one, but I love it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, what's the best way to be a martial artist? Just, just wait 10 years. You know? Um, you know, I wanted to reverse that a little bit or at least slow it down. Um, most people don't believe when they meet me that I'm actually 59 years old. You know, they guess many years younger. My energy is always many years younger as well. And I, I think a lot of that has to do not only with because I love life and I love people and I generally, you know, see potential in people and and I enjoy, you know, um, bringing that out in them or watching them grow, uh, and that kind of thing. And it, it again, brings me back to why I teach for free, why my, my school's in outreach. Anybody is welcome, you know, and just come and, and come play, come learn. And, you know, and with all styles and all ranks there, if you're interested in hard styles, you, you'll meet somebody. And I have no problem recommending somebody to another school like hey you know what you know this guy down the street you know does his hard style is sean who karate go see him or to master rota down in you know this will go this guy really knows his stuff when it comes to taekwondo go go check his school out tell him i sent you even you know um and some people really adapt the, you know, the Chinese philosophy of, you know, on the Kung Fu side as well. And then they, they hang out for a while. And then, you know, like any other school, I got the one and done. You know, okay. It's not for you. That's fine. Um, but you're welcome to come back at any time. And so, you know, when you're, when you're talking about the soft styles, you know, the movements are slow for a reason. They're, they're impactful and you're using your whole body. And a body in motion stays in motion. I mean, that is so true. And then you can add, you know, the the fun part of it. You can start working with a fan, your knife, your kalai sticks. You know, you can use Tai Chi sword. You know, it doesn't have, it's not boring. Um, a lot of people equate Tai Chi with boring or old man on a beach with a hot cup of tea. Yeah, that's true in a sense. But through that, you also learn how to do push hands. Now, you can do push hands at 90 years old, right. right? And it's still competitive, though. And it's still, you know, fun to do. And push hands can easily turn real quickly into self-defense, <laughs> yeah, you know. It <laughs> yeah, it can. And it's fun. And when you do push hands with somebody who knows how to hit hard, then it becomes really fun. You know, that's one thing I love about, like, Taekwondo and karate students when I'm showing them push hands. Okay, okay, so now we'll do inward punches with it. And they, their eyes light up. Really? I, you, you can, I can hit you? Sure. You know, absolutely. We're, we're, we're playing now. I can hit back. Oh, okay, we got it, you know. And then they realize through the slight changes and movements, their, their punches aren't landing as square as they thought it would be. So the impact's different, so they got to change it up all through push hands. You know, all those little things. You know, how you can completely block somebody it was just a slightly moving to one inch. And how you completely miss somebody, even though you thought that block was there. You know, I, I made that mistake, right? Somebody knows how to do that recoil back real quick or a back this real quick or, you know, a, a, or they double up. So you have to change your approach and all that's fun. Doing push hands with a boxer is really, really fun because they got the angles down. They know exactly where the, that's going to land and how it's going to land no matter where they're standing. Right. So when you push hands with them and you add, you know, we'll just add taps to the head or taps to the throat. They love it. Right. Because now they're realizing, wait, I can use my boxing skills in this art. Oh, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. You can transfer those over. So when you start talking internal arts, it's not limited to Kung Fu, Aikido and, 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 and Tai Chi necessarily or Bagua. 
you can open that up. And that's why they blend so well with a, a hard style student for many years, but is, you know, the hands hurt now. Your knee is shot. Your hips aren't quite what they used to be. You had a back surgery, right? You got, you were in a car accident. Whatever the circumstances, you know, um, I have one student that developed MS, mm-hmm. right? I'm like, don't, don't drop out. You know, well, we'll go through this together. You know, I, I'm here for you, you know, and, and yeah, it's, it's sad, but yet, you know, you, you see the joy in their eyes that they can still do stuff that many people have told them that they couldn't, you know, or would have to give up, you know. Kung Fu, which just translates a good hard work, right? Let's, mm-hmm. let's break it down to a simplest term. Um, Kung Fu never has to be given up in anybody's life. A good hard work, you never have to give up. You may, you may change, the approach may change, the, um, the style may change, the, the ins and outs, right? I mean, you ever see a painting and just say, wow, that's really good. That's good Kung Fu, right? Poetry. You're the, 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 um, I didn't get my copy yet, but your other book that I read twice now on the, um, the martial arts handbook, that's good Kung Fu, bro. Right? You know, it really is. Why? Because you, you did your homework. You, you adapted it, you know, um, and, and any martial artist from any style, if you don't get something out of your book, then they didn't read it. Mm-hmm. Now, let's be honest. They didn't read it then, you know, and, and they lied to you because you didn't read it, you know, and I'll, you know, you know me, right? If, if you tell me that you read that and didn't get out of it, then I'm, you're a liar, right? Because it's, you know, from the intro on, it, it grabs you. And it grabs you, you know, and I'm not comparing it to the Book of Five Rings that everybody reads, <laughs> That's please, a please don't, because it, yeah, no, whole, yeah, whole right, different right, league. That, if people are right, reading that, that a, reading it a thousand right, years from now, then we haven't right, done right, our right, job. That, that, right, and I made that an awkward comparison on purpose, yeah. sure, because you know let's let's keep it respectful. Um, you know, in in that sense, the Book of Five Rings is a masterpiece. However, your book is damn good work. Thank you. Right? Is it a Van Gogh? I don't know. I don't even like Van Gogh, but. It, it it's good work. And I know paintings that I can see that I like. Am I an art critic? No. But I've been around the martial arts long enough to know if somebody knows what they're talking about or not. You know, and, and one thing about me is bring it. You know, people always, you know, and I ran into this a lot, and there's actually a famous story about me about grabbing a guy's t-shirt if you want to hear it sometime. Um, but if if you tell me that you studied this, 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 and this, I want to find out and I want to feel it because we're going to find out real quick if you studied this, this, and this. Yeah. Not to the point of embarrassment or anything like that, but just let's see what you got. Right? If you study, if you told me you studied, you know, Kung Fu for 10 years and you don't know how to root, you lied to me. If you study, right. tell me you studied Taekwondo for 10 years, and you can't kick me off my base, you lied to me. Right. Right? If you tell me you study short account for 10 years, and you can't make me bend over after you hit me in the chest, you lied to me. Right. You know, there's certain things about certain acts that you know that has a trademark, and let's see what you got. You know? And if it does work, then I want to know you. Because you, you put time in, an effort in that I can not only appreciate, but honor and respect. Because somebody who, who goes, you know, two, three, four times a week, or even once a week of over a time and does just that little bit each day, that's somebody that I want to know, you know, and it doesn't have to be necessarily martial arts. If you do stained glass and you show me your first one and the ones you're doing now, and you see the improvement, that's somebody you, that you want to know, right? You're an author. I'm not. I can, but I read, read a lot, right? I mean, my library is huge, and I've read everything in it. I know a good book, and I know a not a good book. And when, when 
you read something that grabs you, then that's a good author, right? When you read J.R. Tolkien or anything that of the classics that people like, you know, uh, um, you know, Jules Irving, anything that that's out there, um, science fiction. When you go that way, or if Ray Bradbury, or even a Stephen King. Uh, right now, my favorite author is Jim Butcher. The stuff that he's putting out is great. You know, they're good. And that does stand the test of time. Your book will stand the test of time. You know, is it a classic? Time will tell. But it's good kung fu. Thank you. you know, it wasn't just slapped together. And that's how, you know, I approach my my art as well. And I how I approach people. You know, I, I just, let's see what you got. Bring it. And um, the internal arts allowed me to be that person. If I stayed, and I'm being honest here, external i don't know how open i would be because mm. i was prejudiced a little bit i was um biased in the sense like hey you know i can hit harder than the average person i'm a lot quicker than the average person as well this will last me forever yeah i was wrong um i'm not as quick as i used to be um though like people would say i've got decent hand speed for my age but what's that mean for my age right um so you add all that to it, I know I can do what I'm doing now to the day I die. And I don't have to give that up. And I know it's helping me. Awesome. And you know, whether that day is an hour from now or 30 years from now, doesn't matter. I know that today I did my forms. I did some Qigong. I, I hit my heavy bag. You know, I taught two gym classes, you know, and they said that I wasn't going to lift to 30. I doubled that already. So, you know, looking back on I lived all those guys. You know, yeah. maybe they should have put Tai Chi. I don't know. But, you know, <laughs> um, so, you know, and you see the joy, too. I mean, you, you heard, I saw maybe in her a little bit when I teach. I mean, there's mm -hmm. always that laughter, that joy. It's fun, you know. Um, yeah, there's serious moments, just like this conversation had a few serious moments in it. But overall, I hope somebody listening to this realizes the joy that I get in what I do. And right now, that joy is focused on bringing martial arts as an outreach. I truly think the world would be a better place if they taught martial arts in school, they taught martial arts, you know, in gym class, they taught martial arts in the parks everywhere. Um, not that it should be mandatory, I'm not into that, but the offering with with it with no pre preconcepts, no conditions, just come. Just no matter who you are, just come. I mean, I teach for free at the senior center. Um, I do teach kung fu in a local private school, gym classes. I do an after school um program that the kids go to, and I don't charge the parents. And it's not that I'm independently wealthy, I'm not. But this is my way of giving back what the arts have done for me. I truly believe that the arts have given me so far an extra double my lifespan than what was predicted. Um, modern medicine has a lot to do with that too, but if I didn't have the attitude I had from learning the martial arts, I don't think, you know, I would have accepted those plans necessarily. Mm. And so it's my way of giving back. And in giving back, you know, I hope that energy comes through that, you know what, you, you can do this. You, you, you know, I'll see you next class. I, 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 I hope you're having fun. And, um, and you and I both know it's not necessarily, it's a fighting art. It's martial. But so much more than that. That's just scratching the surface of what can be done. However, in scratching that surface, you can learn to just defend yourself. You can learn to get the self-confidence that you need. You can learn to realize that your backbone has integrity with it, not just strength, right? You can learn the fact that when you start building that confidence up, you can do what you want to do. And you can be really good at it. You learn to tap into potential that you think you didn't have. Even, you know, I know engineers, right, and in, in computer people that do martial arts you're one you know mm -hmm. sitting behind a desk all day is for me i couldn't i couldn't do it but that's good kung fu 
right? You're adapting to what you are. You know, I know scientists that that take kung fu or take karate. Why? Because that discipline helps them with their discipline in 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 their work. Right? Scientists are very disciplined in their work, but yet have to be open minded at the same time. That's a tough jungle. Martial arts helps with that. Um, and the whole confidence thing. I mean, you know, martial arts are part of military life as well, you know, for obvious reasons. So when bringing that all together, I, you know, one of the greatest compliments I ever got was when I got a phone call from a correctional officer <clears throat> that I was teaching uh, in Connecticut. And he called me up. He said, listen, you saved my life today. And I'm like, huh? He goes, bro, this guy was coming at me for this, you know, you know, with a, with a, a jail type knife shivs type thing. And I was able to just sidestep, handle the weapon, put him in front of me, hold him till backup came because it saved my life. And it wasn't anything fancy. It wasn't like, you know, what you see in the movies. It didn't kick the guy's knife out and do some back, you know, fancy thing. And, and, you know, he just simply did what he had to do to keep his life safe. And it's something we went over in class many, many times because of his line of work. And he, you know, he was like, listen, you, you know, what you, what you gave us saved my life today. I'm like, well, then go teach somebody else. Thank you for that. You know? And, um, you know, it, it, was, it was, to me, that was a, a phenomenal compliment. But it, it goes back to what somebody taught me, who taught him, who taught her, right? All the way back. And, you know, those basic fundamentals, which, we, which you bring up in your talk show a lot, are so important. Like, just go back to fundamentals. Soft styles force you to go over your fundamentals again. So even if your fundamentals were, for example, was in karate and you're learning that downward block, mud step, reverse punch, we use that in Tai Chi as well. doesn't necessarily look the same, but the fundamentals still there, right? Why do you mud step? To keep your balance, to keep it low to the ground, keep your energy in the same direction, center of gravity the same. That downward block is stopping whatever's trying to take your knee out, and that reverse punch ends tight. Tai Chi is the same way. You have the beginning and the end. It becomes full circle. Kung Fu is the same way. It may look a little different, but you can see the fundamentals in all of that. If someone came to me and wanted to learn that downward block, butt step, reverse punch, I may change it a little bit. Root here foot here instead of this punch here now that you know um trying something different let's let's try a sticky punch let's try snake shoots venom you know shock to the throat let's add more to that in other words so i'm not taking away what you just did let's add to it let's build on it kind of like mathematics right you want to build on it and when people truly start getting into this softer arts and put the prejudice aside, or if you're in the soft arts and you put your prejudice aside and accept somebody from a hard style coming in, because that works both ways, and I've seen it both ways. Mm -hmm. And, you know, let's face it, some of them Chinese lineage arguments are the worst in the history of the world. Um, they talk about political. But, okay, different subject. But when you take that in, you know, if you put all prejudice aside, you know, now you have two people working with one another and no one's discouraged. No one was saying that stinks, right? When you watch the old 70s Black Belt Theater movies and they're saying your Kung Fu stinks, what they're really saying is that you're, all that hard work that you put in for years didn't add up to anything. You break down the language barriers, oh, your Kung Fu stinks. They're saying your good hard work that you did doesn't work. Everything you did was worthless. That's the last thing that you want to say to somebody who's just dedicated two, three months to 10, 12, 13 years of their life. You know, if they only went to one class, that's a dedication for that one class. 
people should honor them. Um, they're they're going to get out of that one class what they get. Now, are they able to teach other people 10 years down the road because they took one seminar for a weekend? Of course not. Because um, it, 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 that would show quickly. However, though, if they that was their first step, then let's take the second step together. Let's take the third step together. Yeah, you know, let, yeah. Let's, let's join hands and start skipping like the Wizard of Oz. You know, we'll all to see the wizard. <laughs> you know, let's let's just go. Let's follow this yellow brick road, whatever it comes. And if the witch comes above us, guess what? I'm not afraid of her. You know you are. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you're still going to say that. Sure. You know? Sure. Um, and, you know, with the flying monkeys start coming, I don't care who you are, you're crap in your pants. But they did confront it. They did lift through it. And they still, in the end, found out that what they were looking for was in their own backyard. And so in, in all of that, you know, you have, okay, you know what? If it's not in my heart, if it's not in my brain, and I don't have the courage to do it, I need to find it. You know? And, and that's, and that, I, I want to underscore that. Okay. That, you know, we, we have to wind down, but that is a, is a beautiful sentiment for, for us to start to close up on. When we look back over the things that we've talked about today, sure. and you said it a couple of times in a couple of different ways, it's all building. It's all adding. The way you talked about training and other things and these transitional points in your life, they weren't just changing. It wasn't throwing out one in, for sake of the other. It was adding on. It was building. It was foundation. It was whatever you want to call it. That's right. I really like that that visual, and I think it very strongly encompasses you and your philosophy and what we've talked about. Before yeah, I, I kick it back to you to close out, mm -hmm. uh, if people want to reach out to you, website, email, social media, phone, anything like that, you can provide to the folks listening. No, absolutely. So um, I'm on Facebook under Tommy uh, Given, and also on Facebook at Green Mountain Martial Arts Club. Uh, my email is given at gmail.com. And I'll tell you where that nickname came from. We can end with that. And um, if you really need to get a hold of me and, and, and I didn't come out clear here, I'm sure Whistlekick can provide yeah. um, any kind of links and that kind of thing. Absolutely. And if you're in the um, central Vermont area, stop in. You know, just say, hey, I, I heard you on the podcast, or I know Jeremy, or I know this person, I know that person, I don't know anybody, I heard you on the radio, whatever that is, you'll find an inviting hope. You'll have to put up with the 100 pound hound dog. Um, so, but there's, you know, you're welcome to, to stop in, and my school is always open. I mean, I, I, I advertise a little bit, um, but being a not nonprofit school, you know, the budgets aren't there many times, but sometimes I have a really good uh, student that wants to, you know, promote what we're doing, you know, advertise, but it's, it's free. And I mean, totally free. Uh, even the weapons and stuff that I give out, I, you know, I operate on donations and then I put the, everything back into the club and that's how it operates. And the reason it's free is, um, you know, it's it's my way of giving back to what the arts have done for me. I cannot, even if I live another 30 years teaching, give back what the arts have given to me and what people have poured into me. You know, that that first, you know, coach and sensei and sifu who said, hey, um, try this, work with this. I'm not giving up on you. So I'm not giving up on humanity. I just... I refuse to go there. Um, I know there's a lot of negative in the world right now. The political strife is the worst I've seen in my lifetime. And remember, I was a teenager in the 70s. Um, but I'm not giving up on humanity, and I'm not giving up on anybody who, who happened to listen to this today either. You know, so um, that's where it is. So do you, do you want me to end with how I got the nickname? Or, yeah. Or, yeah, let's, let's close up with that. Okay. So... Um, most people, even my family, call me Cato um, or Tommy. I, if you call me Tom or Thomas, you don't know me. That's plain and simple. I won't even respond. Um, I'm not a Tom. 
and I'm not a Thomas. Nothing against people who go by those names. It's just my personality when you get to know me. I am silly. I'm playful. I have a great life. I'm a Tommy. Cato came from, and even my parents were calling me that after a short time. Teachers in school called me that. Um, most people know me as Cato locally. What happened was, or Coach Cato in the classes um, at, that I teach in the, in the public school, and I do bring Kung Fu to public schools as well, to a couple of local public schools have asked me to come in and do what I do um, for their kids uh, in the public school, which I think is a great thing. Um, but that being said, when I was first starting and practicing outside, I grew up in the inner city, I grew up in the projects at that point in time, and the older kids were not nice. Nasty would be a kind word. And so when I was outside practicing, and my father, one thing he was good about was, okay, if you're going to take this thing, I want you to practice it. No, don't, don't, don't waste that guy's time. And my father did meet with um, my first Sifu there in Sensei. He went by both titles. And, you know, he said, listen, I'm going to make him practice at home. What does he need to work on? Good thing about my dad when it, when it came to that. So um, I was practicing outside, and the older kids were making fun of me. They were like, hey, who do you think you are, Cato from the Green Hornet? Now, the Green Hornet was out in the 60s, but these kids were older than me. So they watched it all the time. And it was on reruns by that time and everything. And being smaller than I was and long black hair and all that that went with it. And even brought out the fact that I had almond-shaped eyes. You know, kids were me. They were nasty. They were like, oh, so he thinks he's Kato. Well, the name stuck. And it stuck. And it stuck. Well, by the time I was in high school, the nickname became a badge of honor because I was pretty good. And, and you know, um, I didn't get in a lot of scrapes because they really, I mean, if I, even if they could beat me, they knew they were in a fight. And so in that sense, and then, you know, obviously I was on a wrestling team and, you know, and I was fairly athletic and I had a mouth. So you know, it wasn't really wise, but I was quick at the comeback type thing. And I wasn't afraid of confrontation. I didn't, you know, didn't care for it, obviously, but didn't avoid it either. It became a badge of honor. And so that's where the nickname came from. And it's, you know, so what started out as a, you know, as a bad thing or, you know, a put down or people making fun of me, you know, like everything else in your life, it, it can turn around to something pretty good. And, um, and it just, you know, I don't think, even though I didn't really pursue it that way, the fact that I ended up in Kung Fu and I have taken a lot of Jeet Kune Do lessons and the philosophies of Bruce Lee kind of go with, you know, giving back and movement and that kind of thing and training and stuff like that. I, I think it was uh, an honor to him as well. Um, you know, it's a fact that uh, I, you know, I accept that. So it, that's the nickname. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>